Welcome, Dr. Epic here. What we're going to talk about in this section is hunting and fishing and living along the Texas coast and very possibly eating the people you find there. We're going to discuss cultural ecology. We're going to discuss the Karankua. We're going to discuss the cannibals of the Texas coast or possible cannibals of the Texas coast. We're going to follow that outline right up above me, and we're going to piece together how the Karankwa built and maintained a sustainable relationship with coastal Texas for thousands of years. And to do so, I really have to give credit where credit is due. A lot of the information from this lecture comes from the Texas State Historical Association, and in particular, the brilliant and methodical work of Professor Robert Rickless and his excellent book on the Karankwa, which is called The Karankwa Indians of Texas. It's a very good book. He methodically pieces together the seasonal round. He pieces together the cultural ecology of the people who lived for thousands of years along the Texas coast and built this sustainable relationship with the resource patches of coastal Texas until the entire relationship fell apart. And that's what I'm going to task you to do. I'm going to give you all the information about the Texas coast. I'm going to give you the information about the Karankua. I'm going to give you the information about the archaeological record of the Texas coast and how we know that these sites are in fact associated with the Karankua Indians. And you are going to piece together their cultural ecology. So we're going to start off by asking exactly who these people were. Uh, the Karankua uh, were a Native American peoples. They lived along the Gulf Coast of Texas. Uh, they have a great antiquity. The people themselves go back at least uh, almost all the way to 1000 BC uh, to the late Archaic. Uh, but their coastal adaptation probably goes all the way back uh, to the end of the Pleistocene, uh, possibly even to the early Archaic and in the centuries following uh, the formation of the Texas coast at the end of the Ice Age. Uh, the Karankawa occupation of the coast can be roughly divided into two periods. One starts with a, about 1000 BC and goes to the coming of the Comanche in the 18th century. And the second goes from the 18th century, uh, from the arrival of the Spanish Catholic missions to the middle of uh, the 18th and into the 19th century. The second period lasts from there to the final demographic collapse of the Karankawa by 1850-1860. The Karankawa people no longer exist along the Texas coast. Early French and Spanish explorers roughly described the Karankawa as being organized into roughly five tribes. And there's the five tribes right up above. In fact, it might be a good idea to put them in your notes. And these explorers describe that when they did encounter uh, the Karankawa Indians along the Texas coast, they would find them in these large coastal villages organized basically along these kind of kinship lines, these tribes. And we don't know if they were tribes. Most probably they are large extended families. And that's a key bit of information right there. The Karankua are known from these contacts with early French and Spanish explorers, including a number of sort of shipwreck survivors that kind of wash up on coastal Texas in the 16th and 17th centuries. Uh, the European accounts describe a physically large people, often describing them as standing six or seven feet tall. They made a living in the salt marshes and in the estuaries along the coast. They are described as being physically large people. They are described as being heavily tattooed, heavily pierced with bone shafts through their nipples, through their noses, through their ears, and living off the land, hunting, fishing, heavily tattooed, heavily pierced. It's so it's pretty much just Galveston today. It's, it's like the same thing. Yeah. Anyway, uh, the Karankua traveled up and down the coast in these very well-made dugout canoes. They intimately knew the waterways and the channels along the coast. They lived in these sort of, those are artist reconstructions right there. They lived in these small thatched huts that could be easily made from local materials and then just abandoned when they were uh, not needed. They were they could be contacted, though, only with great difficulty. But the French wanted to, to use the Karankua against the Spanish. So the French attempts to contact these people were generally unsuccessful because they would sail along the coast, encounter these large villages and large concentrations of Karankua, then say, oh, we're going to come back in six months and, and convert all these people uh, to Catholicism. And then they'd come back in six months only to find these huge villages filled with hundreds of people 
to be completely gone. And they couldn't find the Karankwa anywhere. That the French grew, you know, quite frustrated that what they thought were large villages and dense populations on the coast would just periodically vanish after a few months. The Karankwa, at least for the early part of the European contact, generally aided lost explorers and shipwrecked sailors. In fact, there's one particular explorer, uh, that's him right up above me, Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca, in his eight-year monumental odyssey following his shipwreck in Florida to eventually when he walked back into Mexico City uh, following that route along the coast. Um, the Caranqua basically take care of Cabeza de Vaca for his stay in Texas, and they guide him right along the coast in an effort in his effort to reach uh, Mexico City. And if you've never uh, read Cabeza de Vaca's monumental journey across Native America, across the Southwest and Gulf Coast, uh, it is a, a, an amazing account. It's, it's an amazing story that he made it at all. However, relationships declined as we enter, you know, the 17th and 18th centuries. Relations with the Native Americans and especially with the Spanish declined precipitously, especially as the Spanish began to raid the Texas coast for slaves to feed to their sugarcane plantations down in the Caribbean. And as conditions worsen between the Spanish and the Caranqua, the Caranqua rapidly gain a terrific and ferocious reputation in battle. They acquire a reputation for torture and cannibalism. And the Spanish regularly describe the Caranqua as killing and eating Spanish sailors, apparently relishing the taste of captured enemies. However, we don't know how accurate these accounts actually are. These accounts are being written by the Spanish, and the Spanish are being captured and killed by the Caranqua. So the Spanish might have just made these stories up completely, or they might be accurate stories, and the Caranqua were the cannibals of the Texas coast. Uh, no real evidence has emerged either way. We do know that some Native American groups along the coast did engage in cannibalism. The early, you know, the early Texas explorers, you know, describe the scenes. But we don't know if this cannibalism can be directly tied to the Karankua themselves. So in the history books, the Karankua have this reputation for cannibalism, but we don't know um, how accurate that reputation is. Now, as we approach the cultural ecology of the Karankua people, as we combine Julian Stewart with the artifact, our artifacts and archaeological record of the Karankua, we have to kind of pause and say, okay, if the culture, if the landscape is reshaping Karankua society, our starting point should be the landscape of coastal Texas itself. And that's what we're going to address next. We're going to talk about coastal Texas. Now, ecologically, coastal Texas can be divided into two different environmental zones. You have the zone right along the coast, which is what we've got right up there. The swampy and partially wooded estuaries, barrier islands along the coast. And the second area is the inland plains. Once you, once you move uh, one or 200 kilometers inland, you've got these nice flat inland plains that are marked by these heavily uh, wooded rivers on either side. Now, in the first of these zones, along the coast, you have these shifting currents and occasional hurricanes are constantly reshaping the coast of Texas. And, there is, and along the coast of Texas, this mix of fresh water, this mix of, of seawater, and this constantly changing topography results in a high diversity of marine resources, mussels, clams, freshwater, saltwater, and brackish fish can all be found along the Texas coast. There are two important seasonal things to take into account when you start talking about coastal Texas. One is that because of the heat, shellfish tend to rot very quickly. So if you dig up like 100 clams, you got to eat 100 clams. The only time, uh, they're all going to they're, they're be rotten by tomorrow. The only time this is not true is in the winter, when during very cold nights along the coast of Texas, you can actually store shellfish for a day or two. Lower, lower temperatures in the winter months mean that collected shellfish can actually be stored uh, for a few days. Uh, these are the common uh, shellfish that you find along the Texas coast, lightning whelks, 
oysters, scallops, uh, and uh, rangia clams. Those, those are rangia clams right above me. So if you know what you're doing, if you've got a shovel, uh, you can actually find a great deal of shellfish to live off of, off of the Texas coast. The second thing you need to remember is that it's not just shellfish along the Texas coast. You actually have a large number of bony fish. And in particular, you have drumfish. As you can see, very large, very meaty fish that, they can, that can be caught along the Texas coast. But they're not found along the Texas coast year round. Most of the time, the drumfish spend their lives way out into the Gulf of Mexico. And it's only during the fall and winter that the drumfish come uh, to spawn in the tidal flats of the Texas coast. You have the red drum. That's what those fellows have caught uh, there on the upper left. Uh, the red drum spawns between uh, August uh, and October. So between August and October, the, the red drumfish will come up, bury their eggs in the, uh, in the tidal flats before departing back for the Gulf of Mexico. This is followed by the black drum fish, and that's what she's caught there uh, on the lower right. And they come in between January and April. They come in, uh, bury their eggs, and then head out to the Gulf. So if you show up there in the summer expecting to catch a big drum fish, you're, you'll never do it. Now, furthermore, uh, because these fish are spawning in tidal flats, they can be caught in very shallow water. And I want you to look at both of these successful fishermen there on the left. Those two guys that caught the red drumfish. I mean, look, they're, they're in a boat, but I mean, they're what? Maybe, you know, maybe 20 meters off the coast. I mean, the co you can literally see the land over their shoulder. If you look at her on the lower right, she's caught this huge fish and the water doesn't even come up to her knees. These fish come right up into the shallows. You can catch them literally right off the beach. And now the fish themselves are living off of local shrimps and clams. So if you've caught all of those shellfish from the other day and you don't want it, you're sick of eating rangia clams, you can actually fish. You can actually bait waters with cut up clams, with cut up rangia. So those fish, those shellfish tend to make really good bait for the much bigger drumfish if you're there at the right time of the year. I've had both fish. They're, they're very tasty fish. And you can see they're not small fish. They are, I mean, that'll feed your whole family for a day. They're big fish. Now, that's the coast, where the coast has uh, the shellfish. It's got the drumfish during certain times of the year. Now we're going to move inland. And on the map in the left, those this is the riverine plains that you're going to see. This is basically... Uh, between the coastal plain and basically about the Austin Waco area. It's this large coastal plain. It looks exactly like that right up above my head. This is our second environmental zone that the Karankua lived in. It's this coastal plain. Now the coastal plain is Texas, so it's it's I mean look at that picture above my yellow box. It is flat as a board. Basically, it's, it's these large, flat grasslands. It's punctuated by uh, these rivers. And you can see the rivers on the map there on the left. And these rivers tend to snake uh, through the plains, but on either side of the river tend to grow very dense woods. Uh, and you can see in the map right up above that line of trees. That's a river on the other side of that line of trees. Only occasional woodlands dot the riverine plains. And each of these small rivers feeds into a different estuary. And these rivers are really important because they're the only permanent water sources. Uh, they're the only permanent source of water on the coastal plains. Almost all the lakes of modern Texas are almost all man-made. Now, this is the Guadalupe River near uh, New Braufels in Texas. And I used this picture for, for two reasons. One, I, want you to show you, I wanted to show you that these are not very big rivers. Not at all. But on either side of these, of these riverbanks are these dense woodlands. You have thick underbrush and heavy growth of trees grow on either side of the riverbank. And if you climbed uh, up that riverbank and you busted through those line of trees, you would just see flat grasslands on the other side. The thick underbrush uh, along the riverbanks creates these sort of really small but very dense woods that grow up on either side of the river. Now, these form natural hunting blinds and natural hunting blinds right next to the only source of water on the coastal plains. 
But the hunting is not the same year round. It's not equal all the time. What happens is that during the late spring and into the summer, uh, peak rainfalls tend to swell these rivers and they cause the plants and the vegetation around these rivers and the grasslands themselves to burst into life. And what this does is it tends to pull in animals from other parts of Texas. Most importantly, bison. Normally, bison live in these huge herds. It makes them quite difficult to hunt. Normally, bison live in these huge herds up in North Texas, up in the Southern Plains, up on the Llano Escatado of West Texas. But the spring and summer rains cause all these grasses to flourish, which in turn pulls the migratory bison herds into this region, into the region sort of between Austin, Waco, and coastal Texas. And they move in to take advantage of these swelling rivers. They move in to take advantage of all of this sprouting vegetation. And when they have access to all of this, all of these resources, the big herds tend to break up into separate smaller herds. In other words, the bison become easier to hunt during the spring and summer when they visit this area of Texas or when they used to visit this area of Texas. The young bulls themselves, and that's what you see right up above me, these guys are going to clash. They're going to fight over the priority uh, to mate with the available females. Older bison, who are no longer in that game, will move away and move to the outskirts of the herd, moving away from these sort of angry young bulls because they don't want to get caught in the middle. Females themselves, especially females once they've given birth, move into these things called calving herds. Uh, and there's a, a mother and her young... Uh, uh, bison cub right there and calf, bison calf. And oh, oh my God, like bison calves are like the cutest things ever. I mean, there's, they're like ginger cows. They're just adorable. Anyway, so the, the, the females themselves will form these calving herds. So where that contain mothers, expectant mothers and newborns all traveling together. So what happens is that the big bison herds will move down from the Llano Escatado. And once they're on the grasslands of coastal Texas, their herds will break up. They become vulnerable and easier to hunt. And they're eating constantly because what they're doing is they're trying to uh, fill up their fat reserves for the coming winter. And one of the things they'll do to get out of the summer heat of, of summer Texas is basically hang out in the river itself. Uh, this is a photograph taken by a journalist uh, of the Lavaca River just upstream from Matagordo Bay. And I, I'm showing you this picture for, for two reasons. Uh, one, just to show you a pair of bison that are just cooling off in the river itself. And the other reason I want to show you this picture is that I want you to notice how close the photographer got to these bison. These are wild bison. All right, this isn't anybody's pet bison. It's not anybody's curated herd. That basically there's so much, so much tree growth around the sides of these rivers. I mean, look across look to the other side of that river. Look how dense the forest, look how dense that tree line is. That this, this reporter, this photographer was able to creep. I mean, he's within what, 20 feet of those bison. Uh, he's able to creep using the cover to get this excellent shot of the bison. Now he's shooting them with a camera, but imagine if he had a spear, if he had an addle addle, he's getting very close to these bison. But bison aren't the only thing to hunt along the rivers of, of the coastal plains of Texas. This is the, the bison are in addition to local populations of white-tailed deer who enter their own breeding season in the late fall and early winter and often give birth in early summer. But the difference between uh, the deer and the bison is that the bison travel in these huge migratory herds. The deer are local are basically just local populations of deer. So if you tend to hit the deer populations too hard, you can actually carve out and wipe out these local deer populations if you overhunt them all the time. Now, we've got the environmental zones of Texas. You've got the area along the coast itself, the estuaries, the swampy areas where you can fish. You've got the coastal plains with your seasonal visitations by bison and the permanent populations of deer in the area. So we now we know the landscape. And using the archaeology, we're going to tie the Karankua to that landscape. And specifically, we're going to use that right there. The pottery is going to be key 
to understanding the environmental adaptations of the Karankawa people. We're going to look at their rock port pottery, and we're going to tie them to the landscape, and we're going to use the archaeological evidence to answer that question. What is human ecology? What is a seasonal round? Given the current archaeological evidence, what is the human ecology of the Karankawa? How did it shift over time, and why did it shift over time? You have about a third of the information you need to answer that question, and I'm going to give you the rest of it in the next section, and I will see you there.